What's happening, all you mentees? Uncanny Omar here from Near Mint Condition. And join me today for your advanced look at the Wolverine Omnibus Volume 3 from Marvel Comics. What else is left to say then? Let's go, bub. All right, before getting started, I want to give a huge thank you to David Gabriel and the fine folks of Marvel for sending us an advanced copy of this omnibus. This omnibus is due out in the direct market and book market on January 17th or 18th, depending on where you get your books. So this here is the Jim Lee direct market cover. There are actually three covers for this, and we're going to go through each one. But first, I have to showcase the spine because each one has a different spine. So yes, this is the first direct market cover. On the left-hand side is your standard edition cover, that one drawn by Mark Silvestri, and again, a difference in the spines. And on the right-hand side is your other direct market cover, that one drawn by Michael Avon Oming. And the direct market covers are only available at your local comic book store, places like cheapgraphicnovels.com, waltzcomicshop.com, Dying Breed Collectors, Comics Bugle, In Stock Trades, Organic Price Books, Tales of Wonder, those kind of places will have the direct market covers. So uh, the standard edition cover is available everywhere. So places like Amazon and Barnes and Noble, Toys R Us, is that still a thing? I know it's up in Canada and I have to mention that because hey, Wolverine, Canadian. All right, let's go back to this. So yes, Wolverine, this is from a pinup from I believe Wolverine number 50. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and just warn people. I have no idea how long this video is going to go. This is my favorite era of Wolverine. My favorite Wolverine stories are collected in here. Like five out of the top 10 Wolverine stories are collected in here. Uh, so forgive me. I have no idea how long I'm going to go, but I will try to trim it down some. Uh, yes, so it shows Wolverine with his adamantium in his new outfit because he does get the yellow and blue again. On the spine, Marvel Omnibus, the Wolverine logo and the picture right here from Mark Silvestri, and a volume three. By the way, this one is going to fit right over there next to Wolverine 2. I already got a spot saved for this sucker, and I'll have to move those other two when volume four comes out, because I got to announce that uh, a couple of... I guess it's been a couple of months ago since I announced it. But let's shift the focus back to this. Um, so yes, the spine right here, volume three at the bottom... And then Blood and Claws. And then you have this piece right here. I believe that's Derek Robertson, if I'm not mistaken. He did a couple of fill-in issues. Parental Advisory is mainly for one of the graphic novels that's in here, which I will tell people about and let you know what kind of story to expect in there. Uh, but here are all the covers, Blood and Claws. Fan favorite creators Larry Hama and Mark Silvestri change Wolverine's world. Boy, that's an understatement. Uh, teaming with Jubilee, pitting him against his deadly doppelganger, Albert. Was he really that deadly? And sending him on a desperate search for answers. That is the best part about this. Uh, desperate search for answers about his past. But before we go any further, we do have to look underneath the dust jacket because these are all the same no matter what dust jacket you get. You have two pieces there by Mark Silvestri. You actually have a quote from Logan. I love it. That's great. And just a little bit about his past. And then the creators, Larry Hama and Mark Silvestri. But there are other creators in here too, like Peter David and Tom DeFalco, uh, Fabian Siesa, uh, Derek Robertson, Larry Stroman. But let's look at this right here. Oh, yes, baby. Different pieces of Wolverine panels. You have some Andy Kubert in there, Mark Silvestri. Uh, you have some Derek Robertson in there, some Larry, uh, not Larry Hama, I'm sorry, some Larry Stroman. Uh, I don't see Jim Lee. No, no, that's Silvestri. Uh, that looks, yeah, these are mostly Silvestri in there. All right, we're going to crack this book open. Oh, oh, I thought that was Silvestri. That, that is a Silvestri piece. We're going to crack this book open. I'm going to try to not talk about every issue. I will stay away from spoilers. So I'll kind of give you a quick premise as to what you're going to find in here. But there's so much goodness in here. How can I not make this video go for three hours? All right. Uh, maybe some minor spoilers for what's happened before, especially the relationship between Sabretooth and Wolverine and Silver Fox. Just a little heads up about that, because I do have to talk about those characters when we're talking about what happens to the return of uh, to Weapon X. All right, let's go ahead and start. 
All right, let's dive in here. We have some black end paper, Wolverine Omnibus, and a piece by Derek Robertson. Volume 3. Man, that is so awesome. What started as a fun little bet as to Wolverine Volume 1 selling, now we have Volume 3 and a Volume 4 that was announced. Uh, it brings me so much joy to talk about these. All right, so here's your table of contents, where you're going to find them, the pages you're going to find them in. Uh, and kicking it off with Wolverine 31. So this collects Wolverine 31 to 59, Wolverine Bloody Choices, Wolverine Reign of Terror, Ghost Rider, Wolverine Punisher, Hearts of Darkness, X-Men, adjectiveless X-Men, so the, uh, well, now it's the Jim Lee era of X-Men, really. Uh, four through seven, and then material from Marvel Fanfare 54 and 55, and Marvel Comics Presents 85 to 108. I'm gonna go ahead and say... I absolutely love the mapping in this, 100%. There is one little thing, because in my head I have mapped this for decades, uh, or a decade, a little over a decade. Whenever the first Wolverine Omnibus came out, I was mapping these things in my head. But there's one little thing, and I'll talk about, I was like, oh, I wish they had put it here instead of there. But other than that, my gosh, there was a lot of research done here. Uh, for these books and I understand why some were mapped and you'll see what I'm talking about here so this kicks off the Larry Hama and Mark Silvestri era Wolverine is taken out of Madripoor his supporting cast starts going away Tiger Tiger does come back from time to time and she's about one of the few characters that does from Madripoor but everybody else kind of goes away including Jessica Drew who's a fan favorite of mine uh, this is of course during the era when Jessica Drew was depowered and no longer Spider-Woman but Eventually, he gets transported. All his problems start heading over to Japan. Japan. Where he's confronted with the Yakuza. Uh, there's this whole myth about a sword. Oh, it's such a cool three-part story. It introduces us to the character of Reiko, who plays a big, important part in Wolverine's life, especially during this particular era. So again, you have some beautiful artwork here by Mark Silvestri. There's Reiko right there and uh, this is the cover, by the way, that I wish they had used for this volume, and that is the cover to issue number 33, because I think it's such an iconic image of just his claws. I would have loved to have seen this as a cover. Um, just look, there's three claws. Wolverine, volume three, or you should use that as the spine. I love that. Uh, so yes, he did get a little kill build in there, and it's dug into a empty grave and he comes out of it uh dan green supplying the inks here and then we get the marvel fanfare story where wolverine's put in a cage and he meets a bunch of campers uh, this one's all drawn and lettered by richard howell and marvel fanfare was an anthology series and then you move into i swear i'm not gonna talk about each issue i promise uh my favorite standalone wolverine comic of all time I love this issue. It means so much to me. And I'm sure when people read it for the first time, they're like, eh, I don't get it. To each their own. Everybody's got a favorite. Uh, but this one to me, uh, it's from a time when we really didn't know a lot about Wolverine's past. And nobody was really talking about it. We had some hints here and there from Chris Claremont. Uh, Archie Goodwin tried to do a couple of little things. But it seems like... The editors really like the idea of him just being a man of mystery, but this is all about a girl that's abducted by this serial killer who's already killed her family, and Wolverine kind of gets uh, volunteered by these two officers here to go after her. And there's a creature that's out there too called the Hunter in the Darkness. But what I love about this issue, and I'm not going to look at the ending or anything, I love the fact that uh, this gentleman is talking about his past, you know, like uh, he was in a world war and he's talking about like the fights they were in and just how many people were lost. And it's so cool to keep going back and forth. And it was this issue that I was like, oh my gosh, this new writer gets Wolverine and he's doing the things that I've wanted to see done for years with my favorite character. Again, beautiful artwork by Mark Silvestri. Mark Silvestri goes on the long run uh, with how many issues he's able to just pump out. Uh, Glennis Oliver providing most of the colors, by the way, and Pat Brozo is doing the lettering. This is the beginning of the Blood and Claw saga, which is a three-part saga, another one. Man, it was like one good issue after another for me. Uh, this is what takes Puck from Alpha Flight, because they were friends, right? They were both in Department H, 
and Wolverine back to the Spanish Civil War, where we also get to meet another one of my favorite, not characters, authors of all time, Ernest Hemingway. Ernesto, oh my gosh, I love this. Uh, they get transported back in time through gateways, little portal. Of course, it's all a mistake, but they're not alone. Lady Deathstrike's coming after them. And it was good to see her because we hadn't seen her for a long time. I mean, this is a woman that swore that she was going to get revenge for Wolverine being part of her father's, like, part of the, <laughs> the, the reason that her father died. And we just didn't see her after Uncanny 205. But uh, here we are. And man, does she play a big role. I love this stuff. Uh, time travel story. And you do see Puck in this particular story grow to be a standard tall man instead of the dwarf that you see him in the pages of Alpha Flight. Now, for people that don't know, he was cursed by a witch and that's why he became small, uh, or so the story goes. And this story is just so awesome. I freaking love it. Uh, then we have the beginning of the Albert and LCD storyline. So the Reavers, led by Donald P Pierce at the time, because all this happening before Uncanny 281, have a plan. They plan to go ahead and clone Wolverine, make this robot as deadly as Wolverine with, you know, by studying his moves and everything. And they've also planted a little girl with him because they know how Wolverine has a soft spot for little girls. Pretty menacing. And she is nothing but a ticking time bomb. And of course, Instead of killing them, Wolverine ends up making friends with LCD and Albert. And she's adorable, although it might get on people's nerves. But she calls him Wogan, and that's how she talks. Uh, it's quite cute, I thought. Again, this story arc is done by Mark Silvestri. Uh, you have Forge and Jubilee. So it's like Larry Hama. Maybe the editors decided, let's let's put Wolverine less solo story. Let's, let's, let's get him out of Madripoor. The X-Men seem to be getting the team back together again. You have Storm with short hair. I know that doesn't mean a lot to many people, but for us, we know the exact timeline, right? And this is obviously after Extinction Agenda. This is after the X-Men, X-Factor, and New Mutants are reunited. She had the short hair for a while, and then when they come back, you know, from space, he's like, hey, long hair. So obviously, this is before they go to space. I love putting these things in chronological order in my head, like when to read this particular issue. It's one of my favorite things to do. Uh, but... It was like the editor said, okay, let's get Wolverine more and more involved with the X-Men. Or The X-Men can come in as a, a supporting cast, including Jubilee, who was a big fan favorite. Um, and one story leads into another. This one here, finally going back to that Wolverine issue number 10 and Uncanny X-Men issues. You know, Chris Claremont had hinted at the fact, and again, this is a little bit of a spoiler, so just a heads up, as to the relation between Wolverine and Sabretooth. Um... So if you haven't read those issues and you want to be surprised, maybe skip this little spoiler part and move on to the next part of the volume here. Uh, but this is where Wolverine and Sabretooth are brought back together by destiny, if you will. Another thing I loved about this time of X-Men comics is that the editors were talking to each other. The teams were talking to each other. So you find that Sabretooth is just lying and dying in the gutters, in the Morlock tunnels. LCD's looking for Albert, and she just steps on his head, and she's like, oh gosh, it looks like somebody tore up, this is how she talks, I'm just quoting her, uh, tore up the widow alligators here, and it's like they have claws, like Mr. Wogan. So Sabretooth is like, claws, claws, Wogan, no, no, Logan, and that's what wakes him up. Now, if you had read New Mutants 93, this is where he gets really dorky, you know that Caliban, for revenge against killing all the Morlocks during the Mutant Massacre, snaps Sabretooth in half, leaving him for dead. But that wasn't necessarily the case because he has a healing factor here. Here you, you, you learn more about Sabretooth and his powers and what he's able to do. He's not just a clone of Mr. Sinister like, you know, the Sabretooths in the past from issue 221 of Uncanny X-Men where you learn a little more about the clones that he's dealing with. But you had this whole mystery about um, Sabretooth and Wolverine. Like, at one time, Sabretooth was hinting at the fact that he was Wolverine's father. And it goes back to Wolverine number 10, where Sabretooth horribly gutted and did horrible things to Silver Sable. Or at least it was implied. Uh, Silver Fox, not Silver Sable. Apologies for that. 
and it goes back to that story because keep in mind during this time wolverine has false memory implants he doesn't know what's real he has flashbacks sometimes but he remembers certain feelings he remembers the love that he had for her on his freaking birthday but he doesn't remember the year so it could have been a hundred years ago this is long before wolverine origin uh not wolverine origins the daniel way story that Really didn't cover anything from his past, but anyway, that's a whole different story. But yes, this is the fight with Sabretooth, and along came Cable because he was a hot commodity at the time. You have pinups uh, in the back of the books. This one by Art Thiebert. And look at this. Cable, Sabretooth, Nick Fury, Forge, Jubilee. Need I say more for people to purchase this? Colors were a little bit off because I always thought on the cover that was Sasquatch. And yes, Wolverine fighting in the Morlock Tunnels against... Sabretooth, and finally getting that answer. Are they even related? Uh, and one thing leading into another, here's a guy that's torturing animals at the zoo, and it's the return of the Hunter in the Darkness. By now, Albert and LCD are together, reunited. She's just ahead. This is a wonderful fill-in issue by Peter David, Larry Stroman drawing it, about how Wolverine just wants to go on vacation. And, you know, he just wants to go on a cruise like a normal dude, but of course, he doesn't get that. And there's all types of booties in this issue, just as a heads up, because that's the way Larry Stroman drew them, and I ain't one to complain. My man. All right, let's keep going, because we can't talk about every issue. Okay, this is the one that I do have to... This is uh, this has the parental advisory because of this. This is Tom DeFalco and John Buscema, who is a wonderful uh, name to see back on Wolverine. <sighs> Writing a story about child abuse and child molestation. So as a heads up, that's what this is. If you've not read it and those things you know, bother you, I completely respect that and understand why you would want to skip this. Uh, but it's about how they deal with it. So Wolverine is making a promise to this child to protect him, to get revenge on uh, this character that did this to him. Uh, what is his name? Buf, Buf, oh my gosh, I cannot remember this guy's name. Bullfinch, I think, something like that. However, Nick Fury has sworn to protect this guy because this guy that did these horrible things to these kids and this kid in particular um, needs to be in protection custody or protective custody rather to go on trial against another crime lord. So both of these people, Wolverine and Nick Fury, come at odds with each other. And you can find out how that ends. This is technically the second part of the Nick Fury Wolverine trilogy, which is the Scorpion Connection, the Bloody Choices, and then I think the last one's called Scorpion Rises. And then we get one of my favorite graphic novels by Peter David. This is Wolverine, Reign of Terra, uh, drawn by Andy Kubert. So he does the, his own inks. Sherlyn Van Valkenburg is the colorist on the... I'm not very familiar with her work. Uh, this is all about the New Mutants, because this is before X-Force, and... Is Rain really traveling back to a medieval land? Is she going to this magical place where Wolverine is kind of her knight in shining armor um, and every new mutant is turned into some kind of medieval character? Or is it all just some kind of dream? Well, the last page, you get the answer. I really enjoyed this particular story. You know, just reimagining the characters as these, like, medieval type of uh, characters. You know, wizards and knights in there. It's one of my favorites. And there was a follow-up to it, which I think is included in Wolverine Omnibus 4. Uh, we get the return of Lady Deathstrike, the Hunter in the Darkness. As you can see, the stories don't stop. Um, so far, loving the placement of the original graphic novels, and that's where they belong. And then we get issue 46 in here. This is uh, the penultimate part. No, that is the ultimate part of the whole storyline with the Hunter in the Darkness and the Sabretooth and Lady Deathstrike. We have a fill-in issue here, issue 47. It is written by Larry Hama, but this one is drawn by Gerald DeCare, Don Hudson providing the inks and the lettering, Pat Rozo and Glennis Oliver still doing the colors. It's all about this jerk right here who is just uh, using people, manipulating people, hurting them physically now, and killing people. He's just kind of losing everything. And there is a in-your-face analogy here that I don't want to ruin, but if you're an animal lover, you may not like this particular one or the one about the zookeeper, uh, just as a heads up. I try to warn people ahead of time, you know, because I, I get it. I respect that. It bothers people sometimes that animals get hurt or kids get hurt. Then we get 
finally an oversized format the peter david and sam keith uh what was this one i cannot remember what this one was called there was a trade paperback of this that came out years ago uh but it is the introduction of this character named cyber who is from wolverine's past but this is his first appearance he has adamantium laced uh, arms however he also has toxins like on his fingertips that makes you hallucinate and Wolverine gets a little creeped out by him. But again, amazing artwork here by Sam Keith. Just killing it. I love his art. It's not for everybody, but I love it. Uh, Tiger Tiger making a comeback here. Uh, this is the Marvel Comics Presents issues. So you get a lot of these here. Uh, these are the ones that I wish that they had placed right before issue 44 of Wolverine. And that's the only complaint I have about the placement on these. Uh, this is where he goes back because you know he's going on a cruise so why not put this before he goes on a cruise he goes back to canada and he has a flashback about being a part of this tribe and hunting this demonic creature uh and then we have issue 100 i believe this one no the previous one this one here is written by rob liefeld if i'm not mistaken from issue 99 a take on john burns classic um wolverine my turn from uncanny x-men 132 the ending of that page but, yes, Jim Valentino doing the uh, the actual pencils. Rob Liefeld, Howard Mackey doing the script. Now, Rob Liefeld only does this, and it kind of sets up the big nightmare Ghost Rider and Wolverine stories that are to come for the next few issues. And that will keep coming back. Then we get the three... Um, not three-part, but it is an original graphic novel, Heart of Darkness. This is all how Blackheart has taken over this town called Christ's Crown. And Blackheart, of course, being the son of Mephisto. This is more of a Ghost Rider story, but I love the way that Howard Mackey actually writes Wolverine and Punisher. Like, I've always been a fan of Danny Ketch Ghost Rider, but the way that he writes Wolverine and Punisher is spot on. I was, I was a fan of this one. Drawn by John Romita Jr. And let's keep going, or we're going to talk about this forever. And then we get what is something that has been coming for years, the sequel to Weapon X... Now, keep in mind, in the Wolverine mapping Omnis, the way that they did this, they kicked it off with Weapon X, right? If they had gone back and redone them, redone the mapping, they probably would have put Weapon X in Volume 2 instead of kicking it off with that, the Barry Windsor Smith story. So, because those are like from issue 72 to 80-something. Um, now we have a follow-up to it, and this follow-up is so good. I love this follow-up. You know, the Weapon X is one of those stories that takes place in his past they were taking chances and they saw that people were like oh people are digging these stories that aren't really clear as to when it's happening so let's go back let's revisit this idea that wolverine was part of this weapon x project uh and let's talk about these false memory implants why he thinks about these things you know he's looking at the car that he owned that he drove around he's looking at the cabins and then he sees that it might all be part of like a set uh because he's having memories about these particular set pieces almost like a movie set like, he's here with Sabretooth, right? Like, go, about to go in, and they're all part of the Weapon X project here. They're agents. And again, um, more and more X-Men star in these, or guest star in this. Like, yeah, Professor X and Jean Grey. And in issue 50, this was my idea. I would have loved to have seen this as one of the variant covers with the die cut. So this was originally die cut. You could see through here. And when you open up the cover... There you got everything. The portfolio pieces, you know, Heather there from Alpha Flight, the marriage to uh, Mariko. Why is he hanging out at the pyramids with Sabretooth? What does all this mean? He was a CIA agent, Canadian Secret Service, Wolverine. How old is this guy? Man, this gets so good. And this kind of answers some questions and then it sparks a lot of other questions. And it introduces us to this character called Shiva, the Destroyer. Who is a program by the Weapon X to go after the Weapon X Project members. And for the first time, we get some names here. Wolverine, Sabretooth, Fox, Kestrel, Vole, Mastodon, Wildcat. Who are these cats? Well, they've started appearing through these pages. And more and more questions get answered, but more and more questions get asked. Uh, then we have the four, or let's see, four, five, six, and seven. Yeah, four issue series that introduces us to... Omega Red, which is very important because this is also a throwback to some of the characters from the Weapon X project. And again, flashbacks when he was with this team. This introduces us to the character of Maverick, 
who will play a big role later on. Sabretooth now is this super muscular dude that has a new costume. Um, <laughs> this picture right here has been drawn by at least three other artists exactly the same way that Jim Lee drew him. Other, uh, other artists at that time, man, that were trying to be Jim Lee. But another thing that was introduced during this particular series right here is the idea that Sabretooth has this young lady with him. Let me see if I can find her. Oh, he's in issue six. So there's a lady that, it, you know, all she does is carry his coat. But Larry Hama takes the idea and kind of expands on it. So we're introduced to this young lady right here named Birdie. Birdie! Yeah. That's with him for some reason. I, you know, it could be just his lady friend or whatever. But Larry Hama expands on that, and that will be in the fourth omnibus in the Sabretooth miniseries. Here is the Marvel Comics Presents story about uh, Nightcrawler and Wolverine heading back to Germany and uh, facing off some of the people in his past, including the circus. But the main thing to note about this is that this is drawn by Gene Colan, who... Phenomenal artist, the Tomb of Dracula. He has a very, almost like, painted style. But now, during this time, though, Al Williamson is providing the inks. So it doesn't really, really feel like Gene Colan. I mean, you can tell it's Gene Colan, but not the way that he would have finished it. Uh, Scott Lobdell writes that particular story. Uh, then we have a fill-in issue here, but it's an important fill-in issue because this is part one of The Crunch. I remember seeing this page again. If you take this out of pan, like out of context, and just show that to the internet, they'd be like, "Man, that Andy Kubert sucks as an artist. Look at that blocky Wolverine. That doesn't even look like him." It's virtual reality. Uh, but you know, Wolverine's dealing with a lot of things as of issue fifty. A lot of the changes and a lot of the memories have come back. And in issue fifty is where he gets his new costume. Did going back to that classic costume with some changes, alterations. This one drawn by Andy Kubert. Uh, but the Crunch is a big story arc that takes him to, uh, well, Mojo World, if you will, because of Spiral and Mystique, and it's all about the end of the world, and you have the Plasma Wraiths here with a twist on them, and that leads into, well, let's talk about issue 54 first. Dang it, I said I wasn't going to talk about each issue. I'm sorry, okay, I'll make this quick. Uh, this is a fill-in issue by Fabian Isiasa. Uh Shatterstar is investigating a group of mutants that are being killed i'm sorry mutants that are being killed by a group of people and he runs into wolverine and the best thing about this is when he recognizes who this warrior is he bows to him and he says lord wolverine warrior of legend because you have to remember where shatterstar comes from right he comes from the mojo verse so he knows not even the mojo verse in present day but in the future so he knows of the legend of wolverine derek robertson supplying that art oh, man. when i interviewed Mark Silvestri, this wraps up some of the stories, by the way, from issues 31, 32, and 33, and also the big story with Mariko and Wolverine. Reiko makes a return here, Matsuo makes a uh, return here, but when I interviewed Mark Silvestri, the reason Cyber Force was one of the last books to be published at Image was because he felt like he owed it to Marvel to finish out the stories you know like he had already committed he could have left with issue 50 but instead he had committed to uh doing these particular issues oh i'm sorry he could have left with issue 53 that would have been his last issue but instead he came back to do four more issues and end his run rightly so uh, just because he didn't want to burn any bridges and i thought that is such a classy move I, and I told him that. I was like, "That's you, you didn't have to, but you, and I'm glad he did. As he got to finish out one of the greatest chapters in Wolverine's life. And then we move on to these issues. Now, these issues, and there's a couple others in here, like the Marvel Comics Presents, will tell you Wolverine 58 and 59 were fill-in issues and occur near the future. And you can read them between issues 65 and 66. I don't recommend it. Just read it here. But it is a different tone. The, these are written by D.G. Ch uh, Ch 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 Shashester, oh my gosh, you all told me how to pronounce it, the gentleman's name. He was a writer on Daredevil. Uh, so Larry Hama took a break for a couple of issues, and that's where you get the iconic Wolverine cover with his haircut that doesn't last very long because you all know how fast his hair grows. But uh, th these are also drawn by Derek Robertson. Now, Derek Robertson before New Warriors, and of course, long before Transmetropolitan and the boys. But this is where he gets a little bit of his early start. 
And that is that. Because then we go to the Marvel Age, and here we have the extras all the way in the back, including pinups, like uh, the cover to the trade paperbacks are in here. That's where you see that Michael Avon Oming cover. What in the heck was the name of the Sam Keith trade paperback? I'm going to I'm gonna see it, and I'm going to be like, oh, duh, that's what it was. Not full circle. There's covers here for Wizard Magazine. Jeff Metz I didn't I completely forgot about this piece right here. It's also reprinted in the Omnibus. Jeff Matsuda. Uh, some Wizard Magazine cover unused Wizard Magazine covers. The trading cards right there. Both by Jim Lee. Terry Austin inking some Jim Lee. Arthur Adams and Mark Bagley. The Jim Lee cards. The Essential Wolverine covers. Um Bloody Hungry. Dang it! Ah, that's what it was. This is the Michael Avon Obing piece that they use for the direct market cover. The internal piece, the second edition, because that's how popular those books were. The second printings of the books with Wolverine gold logo. And then the recolored, modernization colors on, on the covers for the Wolverine classics, I think is what they were called. And then trade paperback, the back covers and the recolors for more of the classics trades. Now, let's take a look at this binding. 1,264 pages. It is sewn binding. This one printed at the iMac printer. Um, I've had this for two months, and I'm going to be 100% honest with you. I can't help myself, but I had to reread every single issue. This is my favorite freaking run on Wolverine. And I don't care how many times I've read most of the issues in here. Some of them I've only read like two or three times. I don't know how many. This must be like over 15 times since I've read some of these. It never gets old. It's it's like going back home and seeing family like to me. I, it, it puts me back in my bedroom coming home from school and getting my comics out of the poly bag, out of the boxes and reading them over and over again. Because I swore to myself one day I would be working in comics. And I wanted to be just as good as these guys. Um, so this one means a lot to me. And <laughs> it's weird going back to this time because Wolverine is so different now, you know, and a lot of these things are just taken for granted. But back then, we didn't know his history. Not, we got hints, but this was the beginning of something that was going to be beautiful, that was going to finally change the character a little bit, but change him for the better. I love this era. Uh, it, and I'm just showcasing some of the frames here because you know like some people are like oh i'm a printer but honestly the paper quality isn't thin as a matter of fact i just did an overview of that uh spider-man what was it the uh, ultimate spider-man volume 2 and that's from the donley printer that has thinner paper than this this doesn't yeah this feels like the thing paper that they used so thicker than what i'm used to i don't know how long i've gone so i got some editing to do but that as they say is that if you're interested in purchasing this omnibus don't forget to check out our sponsor cheapgraphicnovels.com your online home for graphic novels and collected editions up to 50 percent off cover price they have excellent shipping and prompt and helpful service check out their bargain deals for up to 90 percent off cover price and don't forget that cgn also takes pre-orders that way you don't miss out on the hottest releases and they are currently running a special promotion for you minties if you're a first-time customer after receiving your order confirmation email Reply back to that email and let them know Near Mint Condition sent you their way. They will then apply a free shipping promotional credit to your next order in the U.S. Cheap Graphic Novels, your source for the hottest books with the kind of deep discount, quality shipping, and customer service that will keep you coming back for more. And that was the content, the page count, and build of this omnibus. Let me know in the comment what... The <laughs> That's my wonderful wife, everybody. Uh, surprising me. Uh, let me know in the comments down below if you are picking these up, if... Who's your favorite character that you would love to see get an omnibus and many volumes of this character? Uh, you're not doesn't have to be X Men, could be an Avenger or Fantastic Four member because the thing got an omnibus. Anyway, that's it, everyone. Stay healthy and safe out there. Don't forget to leave your questions down below. Check out our Patreon where we have different tiers that meet your needs. Now, everyone, stay healthy and safe out there. And stay minty. Much love.